least three on the couch. Maca Richter. Clage. Blecky. Uh, so I think if everybody is ready, uh, we'll get started here. Okay, three, two, one, go. All right, so this is ActRaiser 2. Um, I've been speedrunning this game for nine years now. Um, this is my favorite video game, but uh, like basically everybody who's played this, I hated it at first, uh, just because it wasn't ActRaiser 1. You know, ActRaiser 1 is that cool, like, dual genre thing. It's a platformer and a uh, city builder. Um, but the powers that be decided that uh, they would, they would <laughs> grossly mismeasure the market and decided that no one wanted a city builder in the sequel. Um, so this is just a platformer. Um, they also decided that they wanted to make it as hard as possible, and uh, they absolutely succeeded. This stage is, or this game is monstrous. Um, but over my time playing it, and uh, certainly in my time learning to speedrun it, okay, um, I've grown to really appreciate this game. There's so much really cool stuff. It's just a beautiful game, fantastic aesthetic, and uh, just great mechanics. Um, so I'm hoping that I can uh, showcase some of that for you over the course of this run. Um, and I think I'm going to toss it over to Blackie, and he can maybe jump into things Cool, for cool. Us. <clears throat> so in this stint here, the boss, you're going to be seeing this particular magic a lot. Um, there's a bunch of different magic, which we'll talk about later, but this one is the magic bomb. It's unbelievably powerful. It does three damage per hit. It can hit multiple times. So he's going to cast that twice, and that was enough to kill the boss. Nice job. Perfect. Oh, we got the right RNG seed, too. Ooh. We're in there. And were you telling me that you can tell the RNG seed by the rain? That's correct, yeah. What? So the rain is a random element, uh, and raindrops fall every five frames. So every five frames, the RNG, the random number generator, changes. So if I kill that boss in the same five frame, five frame window, um, I know where the random number generator is. Um, and I'm going to use that to try and manipulate the pattern on the mini boss of the third stage. But if I get a random drop from any enemy up until then, uh, it's screwed up, and I'm just going to wing it. So you saw a whole bunch of movement options already in Indistin. Now we're in Benefique, where things really get cranked up a lot. Um, so there's a bunch of different movement options in this game. You can just walk, you can jump, and then you can double jump out of that jump, uh, which then turns into a glide, which you can turn into a dive. Um, and actually, the, die, the glide and the dive are twice as fast as walking and jumping. So PJ's going to be wanting to do that as much as possible, but the enemies in this game are going to be wanting to him to do that as little as possible. Um, so it's kind of, this whole game is kind of a max, uh, is uh, kind of like using your abilities uh, as much as possible to make sure you don't get hit by enemies, but be gliding as much as possible. So in enclosed areas like this, uh, PJ has to kind of yes. make use of all this, <laughs> of all these different attacks he has at his disposal to uh, take as little damage as possible. Uh, coming up, we have the second mini boss of the game, uh, the snake. It's going to look, uh, the fight might look a little bit similar to the boss fight you saw earlier. Uh, the magic bomb is just so strong, he's going to use that. I'm going to use the phoenix this time. Oh, eat phoenix, even yeah. better. And then, uh, and then follow it up with some um, normal attacks. Very nice. Very nice. Um, in this next screen, he's going to be wanting these bats to do as few fireballs as possible. Uh, and meanwhile, uh, he can dodge them here and there, but if they get a bad uh, fireball in, then no bueno. Um, oh, nice! Uh, yeah, I decided to use it. Last yeah. minute, right <laughs> yeah, here, right yeah, now? Yep, yeah, right here. <laughs> <laughs> so his health is looking pretty good, so yeah. we'll see what strats he uh, wants to go with. But you can actually take a damage boost off these spikes to kind of um, time your damage as much as possible. And then what's interesting about the fights in this game is that you can be in there. Nice, the one cycle. Beautiful, perfect stage, man. You can be in their hurt box uh, as much as you want, as long as kind of they're taking damage. Mm -hmm. And in addition to that, uh, you can use uh, two particular moves, uh, sword plants and also the kind of dive lunge, uh, the down attack in the air, to kind of get into their hitbox in the first place, so that then you can start chaining moves together and be in the middle of them while still dealing as much damage as possible. Yeah, the combat's going to look uh, pretty trivial for <laughs> as long as it goes well. Uh, like for the snake boss, I fought him from entirely within his, his uh, hurt box and as well on Sloth, the, uh, the giant snail there. 
Um, but it's pretty tight trying to manage the iframes. Uh, so you have complete invincibility on the dive attack and the sword plant, which we'll see in the, the second half of this stage in particular. But the frame that you touch the ground, you're able to be damaged. Um, so I have to position in such a way that I hit enemies uh, as late as possible so I can re-jump without being damaged. Meanwhile, in this level, you're going to see it. So this level, unlike what we just saw, this is a very open level to the point that PJ is going to be doing a very, very long glide. Uh, and there's one enemy in particular, an eagle, which uh, can knock him out of that. So PJ is going to be doing a very, very precise kind of uh, attack through the sky as we approach not this eagle, not the one below, but one more after this. Let's see if he can Good. make it through. Nice. nice. If he had been hit out of the sky, he would have had to deal with all kinds of nonsense here, which, uh, but There's a drop. All right, the RNG was just ruined. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds about right. Oh, it's still fine, actually. All right, cool. Good guy, Butterfly. So on that eagle, uh, this eagle can do a couple things, that fireball attack at the start or the lunge. PJ was hoping for as few fireballs as possible, and he got zero, so Yeah, really it was soft. beautiful, beautiful. Um, so yeah, coming up here, we're going to see a lot of, this is one of the uh, few auto-scrollers of the game, and we're going to see kind of just how useful that invulnerability is. Usually these spikes do what, eight damage? Uh, yeah, eight damage. Um, but not, not these guys, the spikes coming out of the wall. Um, and, but PJ's going to be making use of the invulnerability through dive attacks and sword plants to just kind of make it trivial. Um, this is a good time to talk about <clears throat> the different spell options he has available to him. There's seven, uh, depending on, so it takes, on hard mode, it takes just over four seconds to charge up your magic. And then depending on what you're doing, like what you, if you're on the air or on the ground, what direction you're holding, um, there are seven different magic abilities total. Uh, Phoenix and the magic bomb are going to be two of the most useful ones. And then there are usually cases for uh, a few of the others with no real use case for other ones. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, on this boss coming up, you're going to be seeing, I think, the Phoenix, right? Yeah, that's right. Um, just because it deals six damage per hit, sometimes you can deal, you can hit twice with it. So it is just tremendously useful as long as the kind of stage architecture and boss hitbox uh, allows for it. You actually saw that on the uh, Eagle mini boss fight. He hit him with yep. the Phoenix twice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So let's see how this goes. There's a few different ways you can approach this boss. Uh, if he spits out too many enemies, he becomes invulnerable. But PJ wow. skipped over that entirely. So the boss Good. was only wound up uh, spitting out one enemy. Once he gets to four, you have to go over and kill those enemies. But only spit out one. PJ got the quick kill, and that was really solid. Yeah, it was beautiful, beautiful yeah. stage. Yeah, the, uh, he spits them out of his mouth. Uh, so I just dive in the lava and then sword plant, and I just hover over his mouth. So when he's hit, um, he, he spits them out as a counterattack. So I hit him, he spits them out, but I'm already there with the sword plants. They die immediately. Uh, and then it's just a damage race there, and I'm much better at doing damage than he is. <laughs> All right, so Demon's Cave is my favorite stage in the game. This is, oh, it's just so beautiful thematically and everything. Um, well, we'll talk more about the plot later, but uh, the demon in this cave is uh, gluttony. And to represent gluttony, they used uh, insects. So this is just like a, a big insect uh, nest, hive, whatever you want to call it. Um, <laughs> And so in they're, they're insects come in just like tremendous bunches naturally. Oh, yeah. So yeah. through this stage, if you delay too long, um, then these insects just kind of really build up. So PJ is going to be trying to get through as quickly as possible so that he doesn't have a lot of buildup of these insects. Um, you can see that he's like, unlike the area we just saw, this is another very, very enclosed area, uh, enclosed stage. So PJ is actually going to be making use of that vulnerability again. Hopefully he can make it through very nice. He had to chain those, that's so precise. He had to chain those together. He's going to have to do it a couple more times in this stage, uh, just chaining these sword plants together to get through these, uh, these spiders as smoothly as possible. Another nice one. And then on this vertical climb section coming up, um, so I mentioned that there's double jumps, but if you don't, you can actually cancel out of your double jump so that you, instead of gliding, you just kind of start falling. So every one of those jumps, PJ is doing three uh, jump inputs to jump, double jump, and then cancel before a glide happens to, and, and just to time his jumps as accurately as possible. It's really crazy stuff. Yeah, I highly recommend if you ever get a chance to watch PJ streaming this, you do so when he has his input viewer oh, yeah. going. Absolutely. So you yeah. can see the kind of strain that is going on the Super Nintendo controller. <laughs> Um, so PJ mentioned coming up we have gluttony. 
the idea with this boss is if mm. you stay on one of his sides for too long, he'll lunge at you, and then he'll uh, kind of actually come down and start attacking you on the ground. So PJ is going to be kind of alternating uh, left, back and forth on his left and right side, uh, alternating his attacks. Uh, he wanted that lunge there, but now he kind of, okay, and, th and then he scoots over, brings okay. down the lunge, uh, brings down the boss, and then he finishes him off. So nice, nice. job. Yeah. Yeah, as Bucky was saying, if you don't want the boss to drop down, which is uh, pretty recommended for a casual player, because the boss has an enormous hitbox and does eight damage. Uh, for reference, I have nine health showing here. Um, a large <laughs> ball is two health, and a small ball is one. Uh, you have 20 max health. Um, so yeah, once the boss descends, you're basically dead casually. Um, but it is a little bit quicker. It's quicker by, I don't know, a little under a second um, to let the boss drop down and kill her that way, as opposed to just switching side to side. Very nice. So coming up now, we have Gratis. Oh my god, on my casual fight, a casual playthrough of this, miserable. This stage, <laughs> this stage is made a, a mockery of my entire life. There are three ways to get through this stage. Um, there's this hidden, like, kind of exit, which PJ is going to be using, which I wish I knew about. Yeah. And then there's also a spike corridor that is, like, the most menacing thing I've ever heard, and I would have never <laughs> thought to go through that. And there's also this very tight jump where if you don't make it, there's more spikes below you. But PJ knows about this kind of um, swamp exit, which he's going to be going to and uh, exiting the stage via, via that way. Um, but you can just see this stage is really covered in spikes, uh, and it just wants to murder you so bad. Um, coming up, we actually have the gargoyle fight, which is, I think, my favorite fight of this uh, game. I tried running this uh, a bit. Of, so here's the swamp. So he's going to be kind of down jumping through that and making it through. So nice. Um, and then, so coming up, we have the gargoyle. Uh, these gargoyle, there, there are a few gargoyle fights in the game, and they're, they're very difficult. They have a shield in front of them, where if you attack that shield, then they just don't take any damage. So PJ's gonna be trying to man manipulate him, get two Phoenix hits in, and then follow it up with a sword plant. So let's see. Got the Phoenix. In there. The sword. In there. Nice. Let's go. You made that too easy. <laughs> Fortunately, there's gonna be three more of them, so... I'll screw one of them up. Yeah, so, so we'll, we'll see the bad uh, times at some point here. <laughs> Cannot overstate how hard that yeah. strategy yeah. is. It makes it look very easy, yeah. but those bosses are very, very hard. I started to speedrun this game a bit ago. I started with that gargoyle just to see if I could do it. I couldn't. Uh, I am not manly enough. <laughs> No, the uh, the iframes on the sword plan and other things make combat sound, in theory, very trivial in this game. And PJ makes it look very trivial. It, it is not. Oh. This boss is pretty trivial. He just yeah. kind of like, you ping pong him against the floor and just hit him. Ooh, oh, really? Really? I ate my words. I apologize <laughs> profusely. <laughs> Um, but you just kind of like hit him with the blunt side of your sword. <laughs> yeah, you as... just slap him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and he just kind of uh, ping pongs against the floor. What was yeah. it that allowed him to get that spell off? Uh, so that was a camera manipulation failure on my part. Uh, so when that boss hits the wall, the actual wall of the arena, he puts up a barrier. Um, so what I do when I'm doing the sword plants to bounce him back and forth is that I'm doing a neutral hop sword plant, extending out and then landing back where I started. So the camera never actually reaches the side of the, the arena. I, I reach out to hit him, and then I pull the camera back. Uh, so he's bouncing off uh, the edge of the camera, but not the edge of the arena. Got it. So speaking of, we're actually going to be seeing quite a bit of camera manipulation coming up in Stormwork here. I'm um, starting with, I guess it's not so much camera manipulation as uh, your own positioning. Yeah. But there are going to be a lot of ghosts coming from the right side of the screen. This entire first room is very kind of mapped out uh, because the ghosts spawn as you, approach, as you approach a certain X position, as you reach that X position. And at that point, they spawn at your Y position, and then they kind of zigzag throughout uh, across the screen. So PJ is going to be jumping at certain times to spawn a ghost like that. You can kind of see it. it nice. these, all these ghosts are appearing at his height. Um, all these jumps and glides are very calculated to kind of spawn those ghosts exactly where he wants them. Um, so really solid job there. Um, as we get into screen two, there is going to be quite a bit of uh, camera man manipulation on, or actually, so coming up on the snake boss, uh, the, the bosses in this game actually work, they're only invulnerable when the music stops. So as the stage music is still going on, uh, PJ actually casts his magic while the boss is still just like kind of saying hello and yeah. the stage, <laughs> stage music is coming on. The boss is briefly invulnerable um, while uh, that music stops. 
and then is vulnerable again once his own music stops. So it's just like PJ just totally destroyed him. There is some camera manipulation here where PJ is going to be doing a very short jump right here to spawn that rock exactly when he wants it uh, so that he, does, he can just kind of damage boost through it rather than kind of like get knocked off by it awkwardly later on. Uh, coming up, we're, we'll see how PJ feels about his positioning and his health, but there is a spiky platform that you can actually uh, jump through. What do you think, PJ? I'm not going to do okay. it. Okay, got it, got it, got it. Uh, I uh, think I'm slow enough that it should be going down when I land on it. Got it. Cool. Uh, I guess I was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but that, da that does so much damage, and right here you have another gargoyle. Again, uh, this gargoyle fight, even though it has the same AI, another solid wow. fight. Sorry, Blecky. I'll miss one, one of, of them for things. you. I'll miss one of them for you. If it takes me sneaking up and just grabbing a controller, <laughs> yeah. I'll do it. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, the cool thing about those gargoyles is that, yeah, technically the AI is the same, but uh, the stage architecture is different. So you always ideally kind of want to phoenix them, but you're always doing it in a very different way. So it's, it's kind of unique in that way. Yeah, you might have noticed during that gargoyle fight, PJ actually jumped up into those spikes. Um, the spikes do not gain an active hitbox until the boss becomes active. Right. So he is allowed to jump up in there without taking damage. Exactly. Yeah, the, the spikes follow the same rules. Uh, so when the music's loading, I can't hurt the, the boss. Uh, but the spikes also can't hurt me. <laughs> yep. It's only fair. What if you just turn the sound off in this game? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so actually, I did that uh, with the game saver by accident. <laughs> and uh, what happens is that you can't damage anything, and uh, you just get soft locked. <laughs> like, the timer will expire and you won't die. Uh, it's not good. Um, so we're actually coming up on Greed, which is a no notorious boss in this game. He has uh, four different attacks. He has uh, two fire attacks. He has a wind attack, which doesn't do damage, but just blows you away. And then he has an attack which, where he just leaves. So we're hoping that he doesn't just leave. Yeah, we, we want him to do the wind attack. That's right. Um, if he does leave, then who knows when he comes back. Let's see what he does here. So we start off with the phoenix there. Okay. He does a this fire attack, which is, yeah, totally fine. Just has to adjust himself a little bit. Okay. Nice. Good nice enough. kill. You can see these gold piles in the background here. So we've killed, uh, so far, we've killed uh, Sloth, Gluttony, and that was Greed. Mm -hmm. This game actually has a theme of, uh, like, the seven deadly sins. We've done three of them so far. We're about to do three more, mm -hmm. and then uh, the last one after that. Um, but uh, it, the, this game is just so cool thematically. It really is. Yeah, and the game is structured in such a way, um, unlike a lot of other platformers, you can choose in which order you'll be playing the stages. So there are six pairs of stages, each pair representing one of the deadly sins. Um, and as you beat the first stage of each pair, the second stage will unlock. So I couldn't go to Stormrook until Gratis was beaten. And I couldn't go to uh, Demon's Cave until Madara was beaten, so on and so forth. Um, the stage order that I'm doing here is uh, it, it's kind of convenient, because a lot of the really difficult stages are done early. But um, I'm just starting at the beginning, because it's, it's closest, closest to where the cursor is, and then going clockwise. Because uh, the stages tend to unlock uh, clockwise from, from the first of each pair. I really like the history of this level because in the second screen, there's this uh, cycle that PJ needs to make. As, this, as the speedrunning for this game was kind of being developed, that cycle was pretty hard to make, I think. Yeah, it um, was. For sure. But now, uh, these damage boosts have come up, uh, enemy manipulations have come up, he manipulated a ghost previously, so that it's not so much about making the cycle, uh, it is only about uh, kind of, because you're always going to make the cycle, you're always going to be restrained to that. It's just about reducing lag as much as possible, because that, like, keep in mind, if you're trying to make a cycle, then uh, you're always going to get there at the same time. But the game, if you have, like, too many enemies on the screen, the game is going to slow down, like, a little bit there, just because it can't handle the amount of sprites, so you're technically going to lose time in a different way. Yeah. So PJ has uh, made this cycle very easily, and all along the way, uh, he was just kind of manipulating lag to have as few enemies as possible on the screen. Here's another gargoyle. Stop being so I'm easy. sorry. <laughs> Unacceptable. <laughs> it causes us to get ahead of schedule. <laughs> and, and oh, don't worry. Don't worry. We're going to miss estimate by a lot <laughs> once we get to death time. <laughs> don't you worry. Yeah. Um, so coming up, we actually have uh, Lust, the next uh, boss fight of the Seven Sins. 
Um, this fight is crazy hard. Uh, one cycling this fight is one of the hardest things you can do in this game. Uh, it's, it depends on how much damage she takes. So PJ wants to get a Phoenix in before the tra transformation here. That was really solid, I think. And now he wants to do a ton of damage before... Oh, oh my <laughs> god! Oh, man. So what happened there? <laughs> um, when the boss is fully in human form, uh, she starts tracking how much damage you deal to her and how much damage and how many hits she takes. Um, so you want to kind of sneak in that Phoenix damage before she fully comes into human form, so that then you can follow it up with a couple of attacks, charge up, uh, or, and get, then get uh, one more sequence of attacks in, so that you can just deal just enough damage before she. You can kind of you could see before that she was turning into another ice ball. Um, that would have missed the cycle, but PJ yeah. narrowly made it. Just barely, really just barely. Yeah. All right, so this is uh, not my favorite stage to play, but I think thematically this is my favorite stage. Uh, so the demon here is Deception. And um, ordinarily, when you think of like a platformer game that is revolving around Deception, they'll do like a wavy background or like invisible platforms or something like that. This game took a very different approach with this stage. Um, so the first stage, the uh, first screen's pretty standard, but the second screen is interesting because it wraps infinitely in all directions, and um, four doors will spawn in uh, 16 possible locations. Um, but it makes it really difficult to navigate because, like, you might think you have checked part of the map, and then you, you know, you search, you search again for a different or similar rock structures, and there's a door there uh, because you wrapped to a different part of the, the stage. So PJ knows about when... Oh, there it is. Nice. All that right. best luck. I accept. How can you not <laughs> take that? <laughs> this mini boss is pretty simple. Uh, fortunately, there's this platform positioned right there, so you can just kind of chain uh, sword plants together. Yeah. yeah. So. On the Japanese version, that platform isn't there. And that, oh, man. That boss fight's very annoying. <laughs> so the deception theme continues. Uh, typically, uh, on a casual playthrough, you would be navigating... These bubble walls deal damage to you. Typically, you'd be wanting to navigate through that, but PJ is able to damage boost and actually kind of just enter that door right there, so easy enough. And then here's the deception boss itself. Uh, not too bad, really. Uh, PJ is going to be using a lot of these sword plants. Perfect. Very nice. PJ uses those sword plants to just kind of stay in that hitbox. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there's there's also some lag manipulation in that. So Deception actually doesn't have any attacks. That, that, this boss is really cool. Um, this boss won't take action unless you hit it or swing. Um, and if you're in front, like the, the attack that he uses depends on your positioning. So if you're in front, he uses that huge bomb that creates a million sprites and lags the game. Uh, so the reason I take the damage boost is because it's faster than a damage list strat, because uh, we get a less laggy attack from him. Um, it's also really interesting, if you don't attack him, uh, his, his action is to teleport both of you to a new room, uh, which has more spikes. So he slowly replaces the terrain with damaging spikes uh, until you're left with like two footholds in the entire arena. Uh, so it's just, it's really cool. That whole stage is just very clever. And the bubble room rotates as well uh, if yeah. you're in there long enough. Yeah, you heard Blecky talking about uh, lag manipulation and oh. Actraiser 2 being somewhat overzealous Speaking with Sprite. Of, yeah. um, welcome to Deathfield. Speaking of lag manipulation, <laughs> there is none in this screen. <laughs> Un yeah, unfortunately, <laughs> the enemies just have so much health that uh, you kind of can't really kill them that easily. So they start to build up behind you. Um, and so ideally, you'd be taking them out and... Um, and just kind of making sure that there aren't many so that there's as little lag as possible. But they have so much health, the stage architecture doesn't really allow for it, so they just start to build up behind you, and the game slows nice. down a crawl. <laughs> <laughs> there's fortune that wall there, which stops the dinosaurs, the Yoshis, from, uh, from kind of building up too much, but then they just start building up again. This, um, this is definitely the point in a casual playthrough where if you've, you've no. gotten through the first half of the game, Act Razor 2 is like, yeah, good job, that was fun. No, this <laughs> is the point in a casual playthrough where if you pick this stage first, you just leave. <laughs> like, Return it to Blockbuster. Yeah, correct. <laughs> you just go, well, th there must be power-ups I get in other stages that make this easier. No. <laughs> um, this this uh, room here, oh, first death, but not, not too costly of a death. Not too bad. Um... So this, this uh, any, the entire kind of 
floor of this room is just open pit. So it's very difficult to just kind of navigate through. And you just, there's a bunch of different ways you can do it. You can take it safe, you can take it hard, um, but, uh, but there's a bunch of, oh, okay. No, we're good. We're good. I'm, I'm, I, we're please, good. Someone hold me. Yeah. <laughs> it's all right, Blucky. We'll be okay. <laughs> um, and then the mini boss of the stage uh, is, I believe, a magic bomb, right? Yes. Worthy. Yes. Um, and followed up by some sword plants. Uh, not too bad, though. Uh, can I interject with a donation here? Sure, please do. You sure uh, can. We have a ten thousand dollar donation. Wow. Oh, dang. From, from Thorlar says, this donation is not just from me, but our charity-driven community of Viking land here on Twitch. We really believe in taking care of one another, and thus charity is close to our hearts. Cancer itself is a horrible thing that has taken many of our loved ones from us. So here's to putting up a fight against it. Thank you for this wonderful event, and you can expect us to be giving at least 20000 next Whoa. winter. Cancer, Whoa, um, be gone. Um, thank you so much. That's yeah, so thank, generous. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so PJ here, uh, this boss is very tricky. He does that, an another magic uh, trick here, and then he tries to get that phoenix in. Nice. Very nice. I cannot believe that. So that was greedy as heck. <laughs> so he, he got that magic trick in so that the boss took damage from the magic bomb um, before uh, the stage music ended. And then, but the, the boss is going to start moving immediately after that and just coming in on you. So PJ charges up, charged up another phoenix, and then he has about a three-frame window uh, where as soon as the Phoenix magic is kind of enabled, has fully charged up, he can kind of uh, Phoenix through the boss as he's still diving down. So he was able to accomplish that, and that's awesome. Yeah. Follow it up with a couple of sword attacks. That knight is incredibly fast yeah. if you leave Oh, yeah, he's quick. Devices. He's real quick. Uh, he does eight damage, and yeah. I had six health. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I didn't notice that. <laughs> I had no spare lives either. Oh, my. So that, that was not smart. Yeah. <laughs> We don't expect um, you to be smart. It's fine. Yeah. So hard mode uh, enemies kick like a mule, and you only have two lives. Uh, and if you game over, you have to redo the whole stage. So we don't we don't want that. No. Unfortunately, his lives have replenished, uh, but this stage is wants to take those lives immediately away. Uh, he's getting pretty lucky with boulder luck here. I'll probably regret saying that, but uh, uh, there are these boulders yeah. up top, which are fairly random, um, because not only do they spawn at kind of random spots, random times, but they also, as they fall, whether they start falling left or right is also random. Mm -hmm. So you can really only adjust Taking so the head. much. Yeah. <laughs> Taking the head. I don't blame you, man. Uh, yeah. That lava is not actually lava, it's a pit. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I got I got fooled by that. Yeah. Like, even at least just like have it be instant death lava. <laughs> but no, you just fall through no, and you, die. Yeah, you fall <laughs> off the volcano all the way down. Um, so this is another vertical stage. I really honestly love uh, vertical screens just in games in general, just because you need to chain together those jumps as much as possible. And in some cases here, uh, a double jump even is not enough to get to the next height. So PJ kind of takes that, oh, PJ takes, uh, uses damage abuse to just kind of make it to the height he needs to, which is awesome. Yeah, this is an awesome climb to watch. Yeah. And it's, it's hard. Like, again, PJ is making this look a lot easier sure. than it really is. Here we have another rare uh, auto-scroller. Um, so you can kind of take this a couple different ways. Uh, PJ, would you do us the honor of showing us some weird magic? I There's would love lightning. to. You'll never see that anywhere You else. will absolutely never <laughs> see that. If someone does that in a run, it was an error. Yeah. <laughs> and that's what, like spark? That's spark, yeah. And then the, the, the down, attack, down magic doesn't even get to like, be seen through this. No, speed. neither does flamethrower. Yeah, true, true. Um, so you can kind of finish this. All you need to do to finish this auto-scroller is to just be on the right side of the screen um, when, like, as far right as possible. So you'll see here, PJ close? is making a death close. defying it's close. Down, All right. but he makes it. Nice. <laughs> Here's Wrath. Wrath is a joke. Once you take out that Cyclone, he has no hurt box, so I can't even finish the sentence before he's dead. Out of here. <laughs> Nicely done. All right, good, good. Next up, we have Tortoise Isle, right? Yes. So there's a bunch of different kinds of enemies in Tortoise Isle. Um, only one of those enemies is random, but let's go through what we're going to be seeing. We're going to be seeing these. So it's a water-themed stage, um, and the actual, the first screen is very flat, 
But uh, we're going to be seeing a bunch of different enemies. One is just this lumbering hulk of a fish, which slowly moves <laughs> left. And if you get in his way, then it's just like, that's just what happens. Yeah, he's, he's just going left. He don't care if you're there. <laughs> he, he just... Another one is these uh, brown fish, which kind of by default home in on you. If you're not facing them, they home in on you faster, kind of like a boo, but in double speed. Um, and then if you push Y, not attack or, or attack, but attack or push Y, then they get spooked away from you. So PJ is actually going to be pushing Y at times where an attack doesn't even come out, just to spook away these brown fish. Yeah, there's going to be one uh, with this jump over the shell. Spook yeah, like, so that was manipulation. That wasn't just like the AI. That was PJ spooking away the fish. See. Then you have these shells, yeah, which on the, the pink shells, which on explosion uh, just kind of deal throw out eight more projectiles you have to deal with. You have these sharks, which are the only random uh, enemy in this screen um, because they can just lunge at inappropriate times. Um, and then you have seahorses somewhere in there as well. So this screen and a lot of the following uh, level is just kind of manipulating those enemies and dealing with the sharks in such a way that uh, you can just kind of get them as, as ideally as possible. Yeah, the amount of space that this game controls in the water levels is just staggering. Like, they cut off so many of your angles. It's really just ingenious enemy placement. Yeah. Um, this is another pretty simple boss. His hitbox is just to the right there, but you have to wait long enough for the music to start. Yeah. Because if you wait too long and then just do these, this chain of sword plants, very nice. If you wait too long and then do that chain of sword plants, uh, then the boss isn't going to be vulnerable for a while, and the claw is going to have enough time to turn over where it can actually be useful. Mm -hmm. And this row of spikes is actually an instant kill, and uh, it's kind of, <laughs> kind of scary and very humbling to die to those spikes, because uh, they extend a little bit further left than uh, they might seem. Yeah. And the, the kind of the orb that you were attacking doesn't do any damage itself, right? It's just the claw that comes at you. That's right. Okay. So is this chaining those sword plants as closely as possible? Um, so as PJ mentioned before, uh, every level is kind of uh, paired in two. So this is another water-themed level, Altheria. We're going to be seeing a lot of the same enemies we just saw, but this time it's going to be a lot closer quarters, and the sharks are going to be a lot nastier. Um, so it's really like this, this is one of the harder stages of the game, especially in terms of dealing with kind of what the game gives you. Yeah, it's a real mess trying to react to the patterns. Yeah, a um, lot of improv needed. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ultra baby this first screen because like the speed strats, if you get bad patterns from two or three sharks, you're going to end up leaving with like four health. Uh, and the second, the, the third screen rather, has just as many enemies. So I'm just going to really prioritize health here. Nice. It's those sharks, like you just don't know when those sharks are going to lunge at you. Surprise! So. <laughs> <laughs> so you just have to deal with them as they come at you and just react accordingly. Um, but I think, honestly, a little bit of luck in games is really nice, just to throw you that kind of curveball yeah. and make sure that it's not just that you know the inputs, you also know how to react to what the, what the game gives you. That Agreed. was 100% lunges. Oh, he, yeah. he turned around. Oh, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was an uh, interesting pattern. Um, before we get to the boss of this stage, which is Envy, I just want to talk about kind of the fact that PJ is playing on hard difficulty right now. Um, on the American version, there are three difficulties, easy, normal, and hard, and each difficulty increase changes a... Oh! No, 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 no. <laughs> I, buffered, I buffered B when I held down. Um, each difficulty kind of adds a wealth of challenges. So for one thing, um, as you might imagine, uh, enemies just deal more damage and take more damage. Mm -hmm. So you have to deal with that. But there's, and you also get fewer lives, so there's little less room for error. Um, but then in addition to that, you get less magic. And magic takes like a fourth of the time to charge in easy mode. I think it's less than a second, yeah. whereas this is over four seconds in hard mode. Um, so you also have to alter your strats heavily to because you can use more magic because of the extra magic counts. And also, um, you can uh, just deal, you can cast magic quicker. So maybe, whereas in this difficulty, you need to um, kind of time your magic bombs, you can uh, do it a lot more quickly. Yeah, so that's going to come into play here. This is a very tight magic cast. Um, I have to have the magic ready before that thing circles over to me. And again, there. So, nice, nice um, one, yeah. one hit. Yeah. So an easy or normal, that would be completely free. And in fact, on easy, you would use a very different strat, uh, just because you can charge magic so quickly. Um, but yeah, in hard mode, you get into these situations where, uh, like with the Phoenix in um, Deathfield against the Mustache King, and here you have like 
two or three frame window to release magic before you're clobbered. Yeah. Yeah. And the idea with that boss is just that you want to kind of swat away the head that was floating on you, and then you're dealing damage to the actual flames. Um, coming up here, we've actually uh, conquered six of the seven deadly sins, right? Yeah, that's right. So now we're heading over to the Tower of Babel, again, continuing that, uh, that theme. Um, and it's called the Tower of Souls in this game, but it kind of represents the Tower of Babel. And uh, it's, it's a pretty cool kind of structure because what, you were telling me that um, it kind of actually, as you, it's a very long climb. Mm -hmm. And as you go up the tower, it thins as you get up it. That's that right, right, yeah. So if you were to zoom out on the map, the second screen is really long. Uh, but if you were to zoom out, it, it is shaped like a tower. So the, lower, the lowest level is pretty wide, and then it gets narrower and narrower and narrower. And then you fight the boss at the very top. Uh, but, pretty cool. But that climb, there's no checkpoints for lives. So if you die anywhere in this climb coming up in the next screen, then uh, it's all the way back to the beginning for you. Um, so uh, we'll see how it goes. Uh, the key thing here is that there are platforms later on in the screen which are on a cycle. However, that cycle doesn't begin until you reach a particular kind of like uh, height of the stage. So every little movement here just saves time, absolutely. Um, and you just have to deal with so many different things. You have to deal with these robots. You have to deal with the shorter robots. Each one of these larger gears has pretty small kind of uh, jump spaces where you can land on them. And uh, just like if any ghost kind of hits you when you don't expect it on these climbing sections, you can be knocked all the way back down to the bottom. When a screen locks like that, he can't fall down the previous area. Right. So it's just like a pit. Yeah, yeah. and then it, it still sends you all the way back to the beginning of mm -hmm. the screen. Yep. Um, so those are the platform cycles we're talking about. Not, we haven't seen them yet, but, but coming up here. Um, so it's really just about making these uh, cycles as accurately as possible. OK. Uh, there might be a Medusa that comes from the left and tries to anti-air me here. <laughs> OK. Uh, yeah, we're good then. <laughs> nice. <laughs> that that would have killed me if it touched me. So this stage isn't just about um, a challenging set of platforming. This is also the mini boss rush. Every, I believe, every mini boss we've seen in the game so far, we'll see here. But magic is so crucial, and he didn't get any lucky magic drops. So magic is so crucial that normally, whereas for most of these mini bosses, you use magic, um, you don't have that luxury here. Um, so you're, he's going to use one magic on the eagle uh, in a couple fights. But then otherwise, the magic is sort of reserved for the final boss of this stage called Pride. Also, you'll notice that uh, because the music doesn't stop here, he's unable to use that music glitch. Mm -hmm. um, so, so, yeah. And I guess actually the timing just works out that you wouldn't be able to charge Magic Bomb in that time anyway. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so here is where he's hoping for that uh, a decent amount of eagle luck. It doesn't matter quite as much as in the stage itself, but uh, he was able to... Ah, I misread. One, I, thought he was, uh, I thought he was swooping. Yeah. yeah. So um, if you love Minotaurs and you were hoping for horrible problems, then you have one more chance coming up here, I believe. Uh, we don't have the luxury of the uh, Phoenix here. But, uh, oh, sorry, but after this. But the thing about this is that um, if he got the lucky magic drop, then it would actually make the, the gargoyle fight uh, coming up after this. One harder. more ghost. Yeah. One more ghost oh, fight. Oh, one, one more yep. ghost fight. My bad. Um, but yeah, we, we've seen this uh, mini boss before as well. Uh, pretty simple. And he just kind of moseys over to the platform, and then you can do the same sword plan strat you did before. Um, but yeah, coming up, I think, is the gargoyle. Yes. Um, and uh, he doesn't have that extra magic to use. Fortunately, I think that makes it a little bit easier than if he did have magic. Oh, yeah, so absolutely. We'll <laughs> Hitting this one with the Phoenix is brutal. Yeah. So he just has to chain these attacks together. Very nice. Get some. Nice. nice. <laughs> that is still hard because yeah. <laughs> in, in the other three, well, actually, okay, let's talk about Pride here. So Pride has a 20% chance of stopping the game. He didn't, <laughs> if, it, <laughs> if, it, if it lands on that clock, then you can't move for eight seconds. Yeah, full uh, screen, fortunately, unblockable. Fortunately, I think PJ used up all his bad luck in the practice session. I think because, so. Because, <laughs> dear God, that luck Beautiful. That he was getting, very nice. Beautiful. Yeah, I think he gave you three in a row in the practice. Yeah, didn't he? yeah, yeah. My record, my record is seven in a row. Yeah. Like, uh, so that's 38 seconds lost, just standing in place watching numbers tick down. Yep. I don't know if there's a game that can just indef uh, besides this that can just indefinitely stop you from moving <laughs> and stop a charity marathon from continuing. Yes. 
Good guy, Act Razor 2, letting the fun continue. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, um, the fun's about to end. <laughs> this is Deathheim. Uh, so we had the mini boss rush, and that was cute. Uh, but now we do the big boy boss rush. Uh, so we have to fight eight bosses in a row. Uh, there are no health refills. I have two lives. Uh, and everything does eight damage on contact. Um, oh, and the fun thing is, uh, they give me a sweet upgrade in exchange for all of my very useful magic, and the upgrade does one damage. <laughs> so, uh, we're at a pretty severe disadvantage here. Yeah. Uh, and if you game over, you have to redo the entire stage, which is about six minutes long. Ooh. So, here's hoping. Yeah. Um, it is pretty cool, because like the mini-boss rush kind of had that change of where uh, you have to reserve your magic, and this is kind of similar. You have to approach with different strategies, because you, you'll see the magic goes away in the upper left here um, after like the next angel, I think. Yeah, right here. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so the magic's gone. He has this new projectile attack, which is, I don't know, sometimes useful, sometimes not, but deals less damage, as PJ mentioned. So Sloth here, where was, we were able to do a one-cycle fight before, now we have to rely on a two-cycle fight, which is still pretty challenging, really challenging, to, uh, to actually make. Uh, so PJ, again, abuses kind of that invulnerability despite being inside the boss's hitbox. Really that nice. Was, that was yeah. really solid. Only really six, nice. six health left on the boss, so this second cycle shouldn't be too bad. But again, uh, PJ needs to kind of take as few, but nice, nice job. Good, good, go. good. PJ needs to take as little damage as possible uh, because all of his health carries over from boss to boss. This fight is different as well. The, the hard part was just making sure he got that very first hit on that uh, on the Envy head, but otherwise it's just pretty simple attacks afterwards. So another nice job. Um, now we have the Gluttony refight. Uh, whereas he is just, I don't know, I don't know what's going on there, but now we have Gluttony. <laughs> now we have Gluttony, uh, where he just kind of goes back and forth, manipulating Gluttony. You can kind of see he doesn't stay on one side too long and just kind of makes sure that Gluttony is always switching sides. Right. Oh my god, oh, here, here we, we are. Go. So we have Wrath, who is pretty easy, but then Greed is after that. Greed is the dragon we saw before with those four different attacks, one of which is a wind attack. You'll notice here that there are these flying meteors with a giant pit underneath. Wins, please. Wins, so please. This time... Oh! What? What? Hey, you, you got what you wished for. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the wind, for one thing, if done at the wrong time, can send you careening below, but also greed can just not be on the screen for a while. Yeah, so this is bad now. Uh, there's a one up here, which is cool. Definitely, definitely go for um, that. Yeah. Um, but so he has to adjust a little bit for this Wrath refight. And then for Greed, again, we're hoping that Greed gives him wind in the desired spot and also does not leave the screen forever. Okay, he's back. Uh, so we got wind there. Again, this is all very Im improvised. Everything Greed is doing is like no nothing PJ has ever kind of seen before. It's all new. So PJ just has to make sure that, that A, Greed is on screen, screen so that you can attack him, and B, is when is he can PJ is staying alive on these platforms and does not get pushed off. Where is this? Where ball? are you at? Yeah. Greed? He's over to the left. <laughs> <laughs> um, he heard you making fun of Pride Greed for not stopping the marathon. Nowhere to be, I, I, I he saw went. A, a, whoop, hello. Greed has just appeared. There's the wind. We gotta stay alive here. All right, nice. Four health left on Greed. Where he's, he's just breathing fine. This is impressive. Even for Greed, this is impressive. I, I hear things. I hear things. I don't see things. I see something. I see a dragon. Up, oh, see ya. <laughs> <laughs> He's back. Up, oh, see ya. <laughs> He's back. Get wow. far. There we go. <laughs> the hard read. So that finished with a 69 on the timer. Uh, the time is yeah, like what's ideal? Like four seconds per in-game timer, and you can clear that screen with like upper 80s, maybe a lower 90. Yeah. So we lost like two minutes, <laughs> Greed. So that was deception. Oh man, Greed was not kind. No, that was horrible. Um, so we might not get to see uh, the, no. the, the game get stopped here. He's got yeah. one more chance, but it won't. Uh, yeah, you won't even. Yep. Yeah. So nope. another no. nice pride fight. Yep. Okay. okay. No, knows all where those today. So here we are, PJ only has uh, nine health, so just barely enough uh, health to take one hit. This is the final boss of the game. The final boss has 50 health. PJ is going to be kind of, depending on how he feels, uh, 
there's going to be these boss cycles, and he's going to be doing either 7 damage per cycle or 9 damage per cycle. But the things he has to deal with is, for one thing, these projectiles come out of Tanzer's mouth. That's the name of the boss, Tanzer's mouth. He has to fight those. He has to defeat those. And then, in addition to that, um, this vulnerable spot comes open, and he shoots out this giant bolt of light, which does that 8 damage. Um, so even though uh, kind of these cycles are deterministic, um, PJ has to pr position himself very carefully on each one of those hits. The hitbox on that orb is gigantic. And he also has to keep in mind these cycles are staggered. Um, they're not matching up. So he has to kind of keep in mind, okay, what cycle am I on right now in order for to manage these uh, kind of the balls in the upper left and then the orbs in the upper right. One more hit, he's dead, and he has to fight, refight Tanzra. Um, I'm not sure how much health Tanzra has left, probably two or three more cycles worth at least, but uh, it's really hard stuff. And again, he should have uh, 28 damage, so 22 health left. Okay, so that could be uh, three to four cycles, depending on how we deal with this. Um, the, nine, the difference between a seven and nine cycle, so each... All right, that was a nine that cycle. That was nine. Yep. Um, because each sword plant does, uh, does two damage, right? Yeah, two damage. Yes. Uh, and then it's a bunch of those followed by one more attack. Um, so it's just... We have that nine uh, set of nine. And then one more after this. This is unbelievably crazy right now. <laughs> please, Tanzra, be kind. Won't you please be kind? Just this one. Just this one. Oh, Tanzra, why? Just one pixel off. So there's there's a two pixel safe spot where you can damage the heart without being hit by his chest. So he has two different hurt boxes. Uh, one is the heart, which you can deactivate by damaging it. Uh, the same like iframe abuse I've been using the whole time. Um, and then the chest hurt box, which you cannot disable. So if I want to do uh, continuously chain sword plants, I have to be in that two pixel window. Um, so I stand right outside it, and then I aim to move forward one pixel. Ooh, there it is. So um, this time, PJ has the luxury of coming in with full health, which allows him to take three different hits. But he's always already taken one. So he has to be very, very careful um, continuing here. And he can't even move too far to the left. because Why? Oh, no. Why? So that's a second hit. So one more hit, unfortunately, is another death. Um, uh, and would be a game, a over, game over in that case. We got to do this. Um, so it's just those, those fireballs in the upper left as well as just that heart uh, and its orb and uh, the, di the two different hitboxes, which PJ already mentioned. Um, because these, again, these cycles are staggered. So every single time, like every one of these cycles, the, the fireballs are going to be in a different position according to what, what PJ is kind of used to. So he just has to make sure that they're all cleared. In addition, there's camera manipulation going on here. Um, PJ jumps at different heights when those fireballs are spawned in order to get the top fireball to be at exactly the height that he wants. If PJ doesn't jump, then kind of like that happened there, then the red fireball comes in exactly a, a lot lower. But um, that, I mean, that, but he wants that because he has this window here where he knows exactly where the heart is going to be open. Um, so this, this fight is kind of coming down to the wire here. Uh, Tanzer is throwing out these fireballs and again, Orb hits do eight damage. One more hit is it. So we just have to very carefully position ourselves. Oh my god, I'm just like <laughs> holding myself at every single one of these. Um, but this is the final fight of the boss. Tantor was an Act Razor one as well. He uh, is trying to take his revenge here, but please, but let's not. <gasps> okay, so those yeah. do a lot. The fireballs do a lot less damage. So PJ no knew that. Yeah. He opted to just use his shield, which actually deflects damage as long as you're not moving. He used his shield to kind of block that hit and just take the less damage. Nice. Yes. That's it. That's it. Yikes, man. Oh. What'd you have, one health at the end there? Three, I three, three health, okay. yeah. Unbelievable. Yeah, so, um, so I have to jump to scroll those fireballs off screen on cycles two and five. Uh, Tanzra in a good fight is dead at six. Uh, Tanzra in a bad fight is dead at seven. Tanzra in that fight was alive at eight. Uh, <laughs> so I didn't know if I had to jump to desync uh, the fireballs or not. Uh, I went for it and I didn't do it. Uh, so the fireballs were closing in. I would have died if I had gone for the sword plant loop. Uh, and the only way to survive that is to block the laser and get hit by the fireballs. Uh, so it was, 
You probably pretty... don't have to do that too often. Like that was very no. much on the fly thinking. Yeah. That feeling. Yeah, it certainly was. Um, yeah, that's a real shame. I missed by one pixel a, uh, a, a seven cycle yep. fight. But overall, that was a pretty okay yeah, run. Sure. Um, certainly the first 12 stages, 13 stages were good. Yeah. But that just goes to show you what this game is all about. I mean, Deathheim, Deathheim is rough. The entire game is just super hard. Yeah. I think yeah. it's, uh, honestly, I think it's one of the hardest Super Nintendo games out there. Agreed. Um, but the speedrun's great. If you're interested in learning it, uh, reach out to me uh, any way you can find. Uh, I'll be happy to help. Um, but I hope at least uh, some of you have a, a little greater appreciation for ActRaiser 2 instead of just being that bad sequel. Um, <laughs> but big thanks to GDQ staff for uh, accepting this run again. Uh, huge thanks to my commentators for helping me out during that so we don't just have eight, eight minutes of silence in Deathheim. Uh, and thank you, everybody, for watching and supporting and spreading the word. It means a lot to all of us. So thanks. Stay nice tuned. Thank you, PJ, for that wonderful run. Uh, we have a $500 donation from A Stick Tree. It says, good luck on the Act Razor run, PJ. I hope the surprise glitch screen percent practice from yesterday helped. We have a $10 donation from Lol Cam Alpha. Hey, PJ, really excited for your F-Zero run. Catching this on my lunch break since I wouldn't be there in person. Good luck with pride. You got this, dude. So when's bad TV percent? This donation goes to Runner's Choice. We have a hundred dollar donation from B Dragon. Good luck, PJ. Don't take any wooden nickels. Donation goes to Runner's Choice. We have a $250 donation from Kecleon, card-carrying member of Team PLC reporting in and wondering where the two point, the, sorry, the 202 incentive is. Good luck on both of your runs, PJ. I'll catch the VOD of Mohawk because, let's be honest, I'm not calling out of work for that game. My donation goes to PJ's choice. We have a $50 donation from Victory Point Arcade. Once donate during PJ's runs. I subscribed just as he started running ActRaiser 2, and I remember him saying that it would probably never be marathon safe. But here it is. Good luck, PJ. We have a $100 donation from CJ. PJ, I always liked your style of humor ever since Battle Block Theater with Mecha Richter and the devs. Excited for Mohawk and Headphone Jack. Thanks to everyone involved and good luck to all the runners and have a nice day.
By the way, we're up to $17,777.76 out of $20,000 for Castlevania III uh, bonus run. Uh, we still need to get that up to $20,000 because we need more Castlevania. Everyone agrees with me? Who needs more Castlevania? We all need more Castlevania. We have a... All right, we're gonna take a moment to run a brief Twitch ad, but don't worry, we'll be right back. We have a $100 donation from Saber Rider. They ask, when did Blecky join Team Poor Life Choices? We have a $15 donation from Geister Carl. Yes, got home in time for PJ, but I'm a little bit disappointed. Why is he not using the gray TV from his practice yesterday? We have a $50 donation from Leon Belmont, the original Belmont. This is Let's End Cancer and the Night. And we have one last $50 donation from Goku. You'll never guess what this says. Hype mode continues. And on that note, <laughs> time for an interview with PJ and Feasel. Take it away, guys. Everybody, I am Feasel, and I am here with PJ, who just finished his Act Razor 2 run. PJ, you broke the camera already. We barely even started no, this fine. interview. No, we're fine. We're fine. Okay. Um, so, how do you um, see? This is one of the hardest games that I've heard of people playing on the Super Nintendo. So, yeah. how did you? What did you expect going into this? And how do you think your expectations were met with that run? <laughs> what did I expect? <laughs> well, all right. So, I this basically exactly met my expectations. Uh, I expected some really dumb deaths. 
I expected to uh, have a very costly death against the final boss, very <laughs> close to the end. Uh, and I expected Greed to be a total jerk. And uh, all of those were met perfectly. Oh, so basically this run was exactly what we had Exactly as intended, yeah. Oh, that's great. Yeah, we had talked about um, finding clips from this, and we thought, oh, there should be no <laughs> shortage of them. We'll just clip every time you die. Yeah, sure. And you said, oh, yeah, we'll just, if I'm one hit away from killing the final boss and I die, we'll definitely <laughs> clip that. So we did. So let's take a look at oh, that thanks. clip there. I appreciate just your honesty. Just for you. <laughs> Yep, there we go. Yeah, all right. So here we are. I think at this point I had one health and Tanzer had like five or something. <laughs> oh, oh, that feels so bad. Felt bad. Yeah, so I try and stand uh, one to two pixels outside uh, the damaging area. Um, like I said in the, in the run, you know, there's a two pixel window where I can sword plant the heart and be safe from his chest. And uh, so I stood two pixels away that time. I, I didn't want to try and do a one frame mm -hmm. tap on the right button and just like walk into his chest and die. Uh, I figured I'd be able to move exactly two pixels in the air. Uh, and instead, it moved exactly one pixel in the air uh, and landed straight on the heart. Yeah. Uh, so that feels bad. <laughs> right. Well, we have a redemption clip for you, because after that, you went on to have a fantastic boss fight and really, uh, I? well, I mean, you kept us on the edge of our seats. Yeah. That was probably one of the most entertaining parts of that run. Yeah, that was So let's see, how, let's see the exciting conclusion of that fight there. Can you see the quivering in my headset from me shaking? <laughs> yeah, so at this point, I had... I had three health, and he was at two or three, I think. Oh, right, 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 right. Yeah, so this, I was at four health, and I had mismanaged the camera, so the fireballs were still coming in on me. Uh, and if I had actually gone for the sword plant loop, uh, I would have certainly died, and uh, we would have lost six minutes. I'd still be playing up there. Mm -hmm. uh, people would be yanking cables to try and get me off, and I would be refusing to leave. Um, but I managed it, okay, managed to salvage it, and then killed him the next cycle. Uh, it, was, it was pretty close. That's probably the first time I've, I've had a, a Tanzer fight last that long without outright dying. Uh, so that was an interesting experience. Uh, yeah, after that fight, we had to actually change your clothes because you had just soaked through what you were wearing. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry about that chair, too. Yeah, that's too bad. Well, we're going to burn that. We actually had to <laughs> wring your sandals out. We filled a whole pint glass uh, full of the sweat from... The well, that's good. Yeah. That's what the grand loser of the marathon has to do. <laughs> we're going <laughs> to give it away as a donation, expensive, but I think that's an even better idea. Okay. Right. <laughs> Okay, well, on to the positive stuff in that run. How did you feel about the RNG? I thought some of that Oh, man, it was great, well. actually. Uh, I wasn't even intending to do the RNG manipulation. I accidentally, I accidentally did it. Uh, my muscle memory into the correct RNG seed mm -hmm. and uh, managed to maintain it all the way through the third stage. Uh, and that's the furthest we can take RNG manipulation. But beyond the manipulation, it was, it was very kind to me. Uh, I didn't get any of the <laughs> full screen, unblockable, eight second right. time losses. Uh, so that's cool. And uh, just from like general enemies, I think, uh, where they could cost time, I think I got like reasonable pattern or above average on nearly everything. Um, so yeah, certainly happy with it. Great. Well, I'm glad to hear it. Um, let's talk a little bit more about you in general as, you, you know, as it relates to speedrunning. So um, I think it's interesting because you and I got into speedrunning at about the same time in a very similar way when I was looking at like some of your backstory. Oh, really? Like exactly like. Oh, like time for described. the reverse interview. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yes. <laughs> you interview me, and I'll say yes, and the same for you. Okay. No, no, go ahead and tell me, like, how did you get into speedrunning and when? Uh, right, so it was, uh, it was in college. Um, so I'll, I'll rewind a little bit. Uh, I played ActRaiser 1 as a kid and just loved it. The game was amazing. And it happened to be released on Virtual Console when I was, uh, when I was in college. And so I picked up the game, and I played it, and I just loved it. And I happened to have a 30-minute break between two of my classes. So uh, during that 30-minute break, every day I would play professional mode, mm -hmm. which it doesn't have the city building. Uh, it's completely unreasonable to, to expect to play through the entire game in that, sure. that window. Um, so I'd play professional mode, and uh, you know, the, the first few days or few weeks, uh, I wouldn't get very far. Mm -hmm. uh, and I would try the next day, and eventually I was able to beat the whole game in that window. And then I was like, well, that's pretty cool, but now what? Like, right. I still want to play ActRaiser. So uh, well, let's see how much better I can get. Let's see, let's see what kind of times I can get. Um, and that's how it all started, really. And then eventually, when I started feeling like I was good, and I was doing it deathless, and mm -hmm. um, actually recording times instead of just using like a digital clock with a one-minute resolution, uh, then I started looking around to see what communities were out there, see if anybody had done that for ActRaiser. Uh, right. And it snowballed. And presumably, you found SDA at that point. Yeah, absolutely. Serve VGs around on SDA. Right, and it's an interesting thing, because people don't realize back in like 2007, 2008 and stuff, like it's not like nowadays where you see all these speedrunners everywhere, and there's Twitch, and there's oh, yeah. you know, all these videos on YouTube. Like a lot of people just sort of found speedrunning like, you know, hey, this is a thing that I can do. I wonder if other people do this. Yeah. And like, it's just a very different path to come into it. Um, so 
in, I think, your um, pre-interview discussion, you mentioned that this was your favorite game. Is that actually true? Did I read that right? It is actually true. It's actually true. So, um, again, I mentioned in, like, the, the very first stage, I was talking about ActorRaiser 1 and ActorRaiser 2, how people hate 2 because they like 1. Mm -hmm. and they're kind of, like, exclusive. You can't like both of them. That's taboo. Um, so I hated 2. Uh, and in 2010, on SDA, people were discussing speedruns of 2, and they were like, why doesn't anyone run this game? And you'd get a whole slew of responses. They're like, the game's impossible. Have you played it? Like, no one wants to run this. Um, but uh, there was a really good YouTube uh, ActRaiser 2 player. Uh, he didn't have the means to record a run, but wanted to train somebody to run it. And I was like, all right, well, I have to, I have to beat this game. I may as well learn to speed run it, and I'll beat it that way. Uh, and just as I played it more, like, I, I really began to appreciate the enemy placement, the music, the aesthetic, uh, the themes. It's just a, a beautiful game from all aspects. Now, we had all kinds of Twitter questions about, you know, why, why do you like this better than one? Or why isn't ActRaiser 1 the better game? Mm -hmm. You know, what do you like? I mean, what is it? I mean, why this game in particular? Like, what's unique about it compared to, like, the, you know, 100 games that you know how to, to run? Like, sure. why this one so much? Um, this one, the thing that I like, well, I'll, I'll take the opposite approach. The thing I hate the most in runs is crippling RNG, mm -hmm. crippling randomness. Yeah. So I don't like uh, to play really well and then just lose the run outright from something that's out of my control. And ActRaiser 2 and uh, Buying a Commando are two very, very limited RNG games. Um, and ActRaiser 2, like, you can react to pretty much all of the patterns. If, you, if you're good enough, you can deal with it, um, except for the full screen unblockable time stopper <laughs> and greed just like flying away and being gone for 40 seconds. Um, so I really liked that, and I liked the execution level. Um, it's a game that will always rise to meet your level. So I've been playing this game for nine years. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I first started, I was certainly not this good. Um, and the strats that I was taking back then were, you know, pretty primitive. But as I got better, I found that, okay, well, now that I'm able to change sword plants, I can, I can switch some strats in and out. And the route has developed steadily for nine years, which is a ridiculous amount of time. Um, so there's just always new stuff. It's always challenging. Um, I feel like I'm being rewarded for my play instead mm -hmm. of um, just, like, lucking out. Uh, so it's just kind of the perfect storm for what I'm looking for. Oh, well, that's great. And um, you have, I'd say, a reputation for breaking games, or at least bad things happening to you with, uh, I don't know, like, um, <laughs> yeah. we could talk all day about this and get your best stories on that, and I kind of would like to, but I, let's, let's keep it focused on ActRaiser. So, like, playing this particular game, what's the weirdest thing that's ever happened to you playing ActRaiser 2? Um, so it's interesting. This game is perhaps the best coded game I've ever played. Um, besides Mohawk and Headphone Jack, which is a masterpiece. Best, in quotes. Yeah, okay. best. Um, yeah, there's really not much weird stuff that can happen. Um, you can do things like in Deathheim, it's the boss rush at the end. Um, if you die at the same time as killing the boss, uh, your death will carry over to the next screen. So you do like Master Dis's death scream, um, and then you go to a loading screen, and you didn't respawn yet, so you just die again at the, the beginning of that screen. Get the, the death scream again. Um, <laughs> but it's not useful. Uh, you can get stuck in a wall in exactly one place, but you can't move forward or up or down. You just can exit. Oh, great. Um, yeah. So there's really not a lot of like, really weird stuff in this game. Um, except, I guess there is there's one glitch that you can use. Um, some magic spells have hitboxes that shouldn't exist. Mm -hmm. um, and if you hit an enemy with that, it, the game gets super confused. Uh, and it essentially lets you attack enemies with other attack enemies, or other enemies' attack power. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that's pretty cool, but again, we don't see that in the hard mode run. Well, that's saying a lot about a game, that it's bulletproof to the point where even, you know, you can barely yeah, find resilient. anything wrong. <laughs> it's a resilient <laughs> game, we'll call it that. All right, well, thank you so much for talking with me, and oh, it my looks pleasure. like that you've brought a friend with you. Who is this that you've got over I here? I have. Fiesel, I'd like you to meet Scent. Well, hello, Scent. Are you going to tell us about, what, prizes, I guess? Fiesel, what is a prize? <laughs> well, it's, it's this. this. This is actually a prize. It's, it, that's not a very good question. But it is a very good prize. Hey, guys, uh, I'm Sent. And as always, I'm uh, here to tell you about all the awesome prizes we got going on. Today we're going to be talking about all the stuff going on through uh, what, you know, we might as well call Castlevania block. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, we may as well. Yeah. I mean, it's mostly Castlevania games. Yeah, you got Bloodstained in there and, and a few others. I think yeah. Super Ghouls and Ghosts was included. That's well, basically sure. Castlevania, sure. It's right? It's basically. You know, yeah. it's, got, it's got ghosts, it's got vampires. Sure. Same video game. Yeah. Um, so, you know, let's get on to it. We got, we got a couple of great, really nice, uh, nice things here. So, from our friends over at Fangamer, we have this uh, beautiful Alchemist Curse t-shirt uh, depicting, you know, main character Miriam from Bloodstained, and this is upside down. I tried to wear a shirt like that. It didn't work very well. You know, I could <laughs> see you pulling it off, PJ. I gotta really? be honest. Yeah, oh, if thanks. anyone could, I believe in you. I appreciate it. 
Uh, but yeah, you know, this beautiful shirt depicting Miriam from Bloodstained. Uh, $10 minimum donation from now until the end of Bloodstained Curse of the Moon. And it's available in your choice of size, thanks to, uh, thanks to our friends over at Fangamer. So, I mean, if you really want, like, a quintuple extra large, you know, maybe make a tent out of it, hey, you got that ability. Hey, Fiesel, I'm just going to pass that down to you. I'll take it. So hold right. for a second. Uh, so from our friends over at Studio Pen Pen, we have this uh, beautiful Dracula X map here. You know, just the classic kind of stage map that scrolls by uh, through the game. Uh, there we go. Yeah, it's really great. I love our friends over at Studio Pen Pen. They have this really unique watercolor style, uh, and the map looks great. Um, you know, I'm not, really, I'm not really digging how many stages that is. I see at least two clock towers. You know, I'm just going to pass that right on over here to PJ. I think Can I hold the one that has glass? <laughs> 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 no, no, PJ, you may not touch the one that has glass. <laughs> Bad things happen when PJ touches glass. Let's, let's not talk about his shower door from uh, two years ago. Everything's fine. It's, it's all fine. Um, anyway, guys, last but not least, we have this absolutely beautiful Castlevania print from our friends over at uh, Beanie Coffee Illustrations. Uh, really evocative of, um, you know, sort of like the, uh, the Castlevania, Castlevania anime on Netflix. If you yeah, think. absolutely. And that's, that's been uh, really fun to watch. Um, but it, it looks super great. I love the style. It's a $15 minimum donation uh, from now until the end of Bloodstained Curse of the Moon. And um, hey, guys, remember, get those donations in because every donation you get in uh, puts you closer to winning our grand prize, which is this uh, beautiful Hylian shield you can see behind me, as well as an expertly crafted master sword. And I'll just slink down in my chair real quick. <laughs> Uh, so you can get a good look at it. It's absolutely beautiful, full metal shield, and it, uh, it's paired with a beautiful master sword as well. $250 uh, throughout the entire marathon, cumulative. So, I mean, hey, you get a little in now, you get a little in later, and you're, you're definitely uh, going to be entered into that shield. Um, guys, we've raised almost $170,000 for charities. That's, uh, that's nuts. And, um, you know, I believe we're only two or $3,000 away from this point from getting uh, the Castlevania three run into the marathon. Oh, really? Oh, let's get that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We, we, we got to get that in. I mean, that's an amazing speed game. Yeah, certainly. Hey, can you get some applause for Castlevania? Yeah, yeah sure. definitely. Definitely an amazing speed game, uh, one with a long and storied history. I really want to see it in the marathon. Um, and our friends over at, uh, at the RB social media team, who've been doing that uh, lovely paper craft you know, on the break screen between games, have promised to make us a beautiful Castlevania three themed paper Papercraft if that gets in the marathon. And again, hey, it's only one or two K out. So let's get that in and let's get that item uh, in that raffle for you guys to win. Um, and Fiesel, I think that's just about it for me. Thank you as always for having me here on the set with you. PJ, amazing act raiser to run. Always oh, thanks, a pleasure Seth. to watch your speed runs. Appreciate it. Thank you. Well, coming up next, we have a Castlevania Symphony of the Night. Speaking of old school runners, we have Satoru Yu running and Michael Yama commentating. I can't oh, wow. What wow. year is it? <laughs> I know. It's like 2009 again. What he has awoken here? from his slumber. <laughs> anyway, let's kick it over to the front. Thanks very much. Thank you. Well, I'm not the only person who awoke from their slumber because Castlevania 3 has also awoken.